Hello, good day, and welcome back to Go on the Run. And today we're going to continue with Pocket Base. In a previous video, we created a number of collections and show how you can create relationships between connections. So today I want to show you how to populate those collections. All right, so let's jump in. So here I am at my command line, and I'm going to get Pocket Base up and running so let's do that and I'm going to jump over to my UI and show you that's all yep um, is exactly where we left off we created two users if you remember and one of the users we created we didn't give them a user name so pocket base assigned them the users very funky name users some number we also had our carts collection which we see a shopping cart is something that's owned by a user and can have a payment method discount and you know we can say whether it was ordered or not which is a boolean field i'm not going to go through all of them because we want to keep these videos nice and short so i can push them out regularly if it gets too long then it's harder for me to push them out regularly all right so we have our cards item you know the relationship go back and look at this diagram in the previous video that shows you the relationship between these different collections uh, the only thing i want to show you here is that I have some labels and so I have office supply, fiction, book, audio, CD, electronics. You can have different ones. It doesn't matter. And don't criticize my items when I do create them and assign them labels like, hey, where all those labels don't go with those items. It's just demonstration. So don't get hung up on the small stuff. Okay. To help us move along a bit quickly, what we're going to do is jump over here to our um, editor. And the first thing I want to start with is this file. Now, if you recall, I said that I'm going to use the REST client plugin. And I showed you that um, a two few in the last video that I installed this. There are all these capabilities, blah, blah, blah. And if you want to use that, you should definitely read the documentation. Or you can just stick with the command line. Or you can just use some other graphical client. But I'm using REST client. And so I create this file called .hdp. And in this example file, if you remember, I, I told you you can create file level variables, or I said variables, and this is how you create a variable. And the nice thing with creating a variable is that we can reference it multiple times. The problem with this type of variable, it's a file level variable. And so which means that in my other files, if I need to use the same um, base URL, I'll have to have this same variable again. A way to get around that is to use a, that env file. The nice thing with that env file is just a key value pair. So I have the key and then the value. And what I can do with that now is I can reference this key, base URL. We'll get around to the other keys and values later. The important thing here is that I have this key, base URL, and I can reference it in my um, that HTTP file. And the way I do that is let's say I want to replace this variable, that's a file level variable, with a variable from a .env file. I can just type that. And you can see it says HTTP system variable that comes from .env file and the variable name. And it was called base underscore URL. And now once I do that, it's going to read this value now from this in the env file which means i can get rid of this out of this file and the nice thing about this if you in an environment where you work with a number of people you can pass around this file and then each person depending on what they're doing can have um you know that env file with different settings so you don't have to change this um, each person can choose to set the values to whatever they want and it picks it up from the environment okay so with that said now the only thing that's new here is that there's this thing that says at name login. So what is this? If you notice, there's a single pong here, like a comment and a space. And then there's this at name. These two things must be this way. And if you do that, then the thing that follows it becomes the name of this request. So we're naming this request login. What I can do then is refer back to it and say, I want to get either the request information or the response. So let's send this request. And you can see here, this is the response of it, right? We get this JSON document with record and 
token. So basically two fields. So if I want to save the token, I can just say, hey, grab from this login request the response. And from the response, I want the response body. Instead of, let's say, the response header, I want the response body. And I want to refer to the JSON object. And by the way, the documentation tell you all of this. So definitely, if you're going to use H um, REST client, please read the documentation. And for that JSON document, I want a token, which is this. And so I want to store it in this file variable called authentication token. Now, once I have the authentication token saved, which it is in this case, because I just sent this request. Remember, if you don't send a request, you can't have the va value. Now, I can send additional requests. So here's another request, which I've called create cart. That create cart can now use as the bearer token for this authorization header, this auth token that I got from this previous request. And so you can see here, it pulled it out and stored it. And now I can refer to it. And so you can send it now to create a shopping cart whose payment type is cash and have a 10% discount. So now I can send that like that. And notice I have this error. It says only admin can perform this action. Now we know this already. We know that our collections by default are protected. And we know that we can unlock it so that anyone can send a request. But we don't want to do that, right? We want people who are authenticated, who are actual users, to be able to create shopping carts. So let's go to our pocket base and we'll go to cart and we'll go to the settings and then we want to go to API rules. And currently it's set to admin only. Let's focus on the create. So we say we want to unlock this. Now, if we leave it as a empty, um, you know, nothing there, that says that oh, anybody can post it. Now, this is saying, if you look at this inf information, I guess it says the create rule is ex executed after a dry save. Well, a pretend save, think of a dry save as a pretend save. People who know Unix might know dry run, which is kind of like a fake run. You know, you run a command, certain command have a minus N to say dry run, which sort of says executed, but doesn't really, don't really do it. And so that's like a percent save. So it's after a dry save of the submitted data, giving you access to the main record field as in every other rule. Okay. So if that's a mouthful, basically, if we go to the pocket base filter syntax operator here, this documentation is going to come up and you should please, please, please read this. But for now, we're going to skip a little, at a little bit. And you can see it can say lock, which is default, which means that I was only admin only. And it could be empty, which is anyone. Or it could be a non-empty string, which is not lock, which is not empty. And this is going to apply the rules. So, for example, you can say that, oh, if you put like, let's say you had a collection with a status field, and it can take on the value active, you can see only return records that satisfy this condition. So the rules become a condition. Now for the create rules, create rule, it says that oh, it's sort of the rule is applied after a dry save. So it does a save, but not the real save, that's gonna pretend, persist, and then it applies the rule, and if the rule pass, then it will actually save the data. Otherwise, you'll get like a 404 or whatever. Thing. So they talk about the rule syntax, but here is an example. So you have um, your collection fields, which I mentioned just now, like status could be a field. So you can say, I have a rule that says, you know, there's some field that status, you know, if it had like a nested field and it's not equals to pending, then do something like only those records should be updated or only those records should be deleted or only those records should be returned or whatever. You also have access to a at request um, object. You have at collection, so you can access all collections. So you can say at collection that news to get to the news collection, right? Um, and then you have a bunch of operators like not equals and all that stuff. Again, please read this. I, I'm not going to spend time right now to go through all of this. What this means though is that if you scroll down to the example here, you can see allow only registered users. This is what we want. We can say at the request, right? The request object, check and see if there are, there's an auth object in there. And if that auth object has an ID, 
make sure the ID is not empty. Because if it's not empty, it means somebody is the person, the, the person who's sending this request is authenticated. Remember, when we send a request with the authorization header, PocketBase is going to get that, look up the user, and then populate that request object with that user authentication information. I'll show you what that looks like. Let's go back here. Now, and we're going to say we want to do at request. And notice for at request, we have Ought, we have ought that all kind of thing, all the fields, right? Email, everything that you would expect for a user record, right? That's what those fields are. It's all the same fields that's in the user record. So basically, PocketBase took that user, um, the token, find the user who's authenticated with that token, and populate the request with it. You can get um, request context. You can get the request data, which is the data that was sent into that request, and of course. If we're talking here about a cart, we're talking about the discount, we can talk about the ID, the order, payment method, all these things. We can check and see if those specific things are there in, or access those specific things in this request, or even check and see if they're set. And then we, of course, we have for the cart, we have the user and the user ID. So um, I'm not gonna go through all of that, but only thing I want to say is we want to be able to say request, that ought that id that id is not equals to an empty string and that's who's going to be able to create that's the only people who want to be able to do create similarly if you think about updating a um cart who do you want to be able to update the cart we want a person who owns that cart to update it so it seems to me that what we want is to say request that ought that id is equals Two, in the shopping cart, we have a user field, right? So the ID for the person who is authenticated should be the same as the person who created that cart, which we know for when the cart is created, you're going to set your user ID. Same thing, we want only person to be able to delete a, um, a shopping cart is the person who created it, right? Or maybe we might say that our users can delete their own shopping cart, maybe only admin, but either way, um, or we can actually do it. Let's do it. Let's make it so only admin can delete shopping carts for whatever reason. All right? What about viewing? Well, same thing. You should only be able to view your own shopping cart. Remember, admins can always override these things, so that's not a problem. Um, so, and you should only list your own shopping cart. So once we do save, now if we go back here and we try to now create the shopping cart again, remember we're already authenticated. So if we send this, bam, we're able to create a shopping cart. So we have shopping cart collection, we have the shopping cart ID, and we're saying that we can use cash method and we have the 10% discount. Here's a problem though. For this shopping cart we just created, it doesn't have a user. Well, that's a problem. Well, if we go back here and we refresh, no user. So um, that means that when this user try to get um, the shopping cart. Let's say we get our shopping cart by sending this request. We look like we don't have a shopping cart, but we just created a shopping cart and we said it was created successfully. Why isn't it that we have our shopping cart? Well, that's because again, we said that the only um, shopping carts that should be returned are the ones where the user authenticated user ID matches this ID. And this shopping cart certainly doesn't have one. So let's set that, let's fix that. So we're gonna say this shopping cart was created by the user John Doe. And as a matter of fact, while we're here, why don't we make it so that if you try to create a shopping cart and you don't have a user ID, if it's empty, it fails. So we'll say that that field cannot be, it must be non-empty. Um, so it doesn't allow you to create a shopping cart without a user. And so now with that fixed, if we go back here, and we send our request again. Notice when we send our request, we get back our shopping cart, and that's because the user ID matches here. All right, so now we know how to create shopping cart. Let's talk about creating items. So let's close this bit, close the response thing. And so this file contains a number of items that we're gonna insert into our collection. Now, 
we don't want to let users create items. So if we go back here and we look at items, we don't have any items. And certainly if we go to the API rules, it's all admin. So for the purposes of being able to just create some items, so now, which we can do right here and then that be that. But since we have them in our file, which I'll commit these files so you can have them. And of course you have to change these settings, these, you have to change these values for the labels to match your collection. So here's our first one. Let's insert an ad form. Again, this is pretty straightforward. We don't have to authenticate or anything because we've opened up the API, right? We have ad phone is the name of that item. Description, noise canceling, ad phone, price, and label. We want to label it with these two things. What do these two things mean? Well, let's go back to my collection here and look at labels. I showed you this before. I have labels. And back and forth, we have a label with six Y and L O. What is that? L O is this guy, electronics. So U L O, U L O is electronics, which our headphone is, and it's uh, 6Y. It has to do with audio. So this is what you will need to change. You have to change these values to match the labels that you have in your database. So let's just send these now that we have opened up the items API. And we should see we have a new item collect created. Let's create second item or third item, fourth item, and finally, our fifth item. And once we do that, and we go back to items now, you can see here are items. Now, we can log back our API. Now, here is our item and Harry Potter collection. Well, let's copy this ID for this Harry Potter collection. And let's go back to our editor. And what we're going to do is open up our env file and say for Harry Potter, this is the ID, it's overriding. For whiteboard, um, which is, uh, yeah, whiteboard markers, yep, dry eraser marker, this is the ID, paste that there. For the Lord of the Ring item, that book, Lord of the Ring, there we go, paste that over there. And pencil, copy this, go back here, Paste that. And finally, headphones. Copy this, paste it. Now, in my ENV file, I can have a comment before the key value. I can't put it to the side. Now, if I put it to the side, the reason why, if I was to comment to the side of data, this is Harry Potter, what's going to happen is item here will be equal to this entire value that's on the line, including the comment. So, and that's going to be a problem when we could try to send it um, over to. Um, or a database, right? Try to create because that's not going to be the item name. So that's why it's a name this way. So I know these are not very descriptive names. They're just item one, item two. Now, same thing for our next user that we want to use to authenticate with. We use user 48, you know, that's the one that I have and the password. All right. So now that we've created our items, we've updated our ENV files to match the IDs of those items in our database. Now we can come to this file and we can see, well, we have a login request for this user using what? The username and password that we pull out of the env file. We've seen this already. We're going to save their token, but we also want to save the ID. Why do we want the ID for that user? Because now when we create our shopping cart, we want to specify who owns the shopping cart. If you remember, the first time when we created a shopping cart, we didn't have an ID and our shopping cart was created without an ID and that was a problem because when we go fetch all our shopping carts, we didn't get back that shopping cart. Once we create a shopping cart, we'll want to have the shopping cart ID and notice how we do that. So let's do this. Let's start off by first logging in as this user. And so we log in, we save their token and their user ID. User ID is here, token is there, that's saved. We can verify it by going here. We see the token. We can go here, see the user ID. Now we want to create a shopping cart. Let's go back and make sure. So in terms of shopping cart, we only have the one shopping cart owned by the user John Doe. 
So let's send to create a shopping cart. And we can see we have a new shopping cart that's supposed to have a 10% discount. And notice the user ID is the user ID we, um, we have saved. So if we go back here and we refresh, we should see we have another shopping cart. And again, it references that user. So that's great. If we hover over here, we can see the detail of that user. Finally, we know that once we created this shopping cart, we have the ID for that shopping cart that's stored here. And so now we can then go add some items. We can buy some items. Let's buy an headphone. Buying an headphone is we still want to make sure that only authenticated users can put things in the shopping cart. Now, how do you put things in a shopping cart? Well, remember what we said. The way you put things in a shopping cart is really creating an item or a record in the cart items ID, the cart items collection, where we reference the shopping cart and the particular item and how many we want and so on. We had to do it this way because within the shopping cart itself, we couldn't really put in items and the quantity because the cart is just one record. So we needed something else to link to it. Okay, so please go back and look at the um, ERD diagram, right? Or different collection and how they did a relationship. So we have the shopping cart that we can reference and we have the item we want to purchase. This is coming from our .env file, and that is why we went and put them in here. So now we want to buy one headphone, so let's send the request. Uh, this is, again, protected by admin. Okay, so let's go here and fix that. So if we go there, API rules, again, we want to make sure that only user was authenticated, so we can say request ID, not equals to an empty string. I'm going to just copy this and paste it to all these guys. So, yep, that. And of course, here, if you're going to update your shopping cart so that um, you want to change the quantity, well, I want to make sure that's how you own the shopping cart. So, it's going to be the shopping cart right and if you scroll down you're gonna see that how we can reference a number of things so it's the cart user.id we want to make sure it's equal to the authenticated user id does that make sense so we're sort of drilling down and navigating through this cart item cart field to say access the user um ref reference and its id and make sure it's the authenticated user if that make, doesn't make sense to you, please read the documentation that you're going to find here. All right. So I save that. And now I'm going to come back here. And we're already authenticated. Let's send our request again to add that to our cart. And um, yet we buy, bought an earphone, a headphone. Let's buy two pencils. And let's buy five copies of the Lord of the Ring. And if we go back here to our cart items and refresh, we should see that how we bought five copies of Lord of the Rings, we bought two pencils, we bought a headphone, and they're all in the same shopping cart. And that's it. Now, with some UI magic, you can have a user login, and as soon as they log in, you fetch the cart for that user, and then you go back and you fetch all the items in that shopping cart by simply saying, give me all the items shop cart. And you say, Veral, I don't know how to fetch the list of items for a specific shopping cart. That's called filtering. It's in the documentation, but we'll do that next. But at a minimum, you know that what we can do is go back to our cart here and make sure that we have an API rule that says, not only do we want to list the items that are authentic for our users authenticated we want to also make sure that the listing is what we return is only for that user right so you can do more complicated things like this where we say oh make sure that they're authenticated which means all our id auth id is not empty and that auth id is equals to the cart items that cart user that id and that ensures that we're only returning in 
the cart items that belongs to that user. All right, so if we were to go here, for example, and we were to say, let's do a get. We want to do a get. So let me find take just like this and say, get all items. So let's see, get all items, all right? And so we want the user token, we want from the um, items collection, cart items collection. And so let's see, if we send this, it's empty. If we copy this request now, and we put it in this file, remember these are file variables, and we send this request, we should get the three items in that collection. So that tells us that our rule is working to return only the items for the specific user. And that's good. All right, that's it. I hope you learned something. Um, thanks again for watching the video. If you like the style and you like what you're seeing, um, please give a thumbs up, you know, comment on the video. If you like to see something slightly different, comment. Um, thank you for those who are commenting. I'm gonna take some time and address your comments. So um, don't worry, um, I saw them. I just haven't had the time to address them yet. Um, if you're new and you've watched till the end, I did not ask for your support throughout the video, but if you like what you've seen, I'd love to have you as a subscriber. Please consider subscribing, thank you very much. For those who, re who are returning, thank you so much for sticking with the channel. Mikhail, thank you for being a Patreon subscriber. If you'd like to join Mikhail as a Patreon subscriber, here's some information. If you'd like to support the channel in other ways besides being Patreon, here's some other things that you can do. Uh, you can send donation, you can use my Tesla referral link. If you or somebody you know is in the market for um, something from Tesla, please use my referral link, I would appreciate it. Otherwise, take care and see you in the next video. Bye.